Thanks very much, uh, Alan. It's really terrific to be here this morning, and I'm going to start by blaming Gus Nossel, who's about the closest human to me at the moment for, uh, for me being here at all, because Gus got into my ear early this year and said there is something special happening in Melbourne later this year and uh, very kindly invited me to be part of it. But what Gus didn't say at the time was that um, I'm not quite the first item. We've had an amazing hour or so of, I think, the celebration of the human spirit. But as I look at day one, 17th of November, on page 12, I am essentially the first person up, apart from that great introduction. And Gus didn't tell me that six months or so ago. And I guess it behoves me to actually start in my own inelegant, awkward way to kind of set the scene for what I think is going to be an extraordinary couple of days. Because uh, when I think about creativity and innovation, I actually don't start at the deep end and say, what are we creating or what are we innovating? I'm actually starting, if you like, at the primitive end. Why? What innately inside us? leads us to be creative and innovative in the first place. There are a number of reasons for that. Many of us just want to improve our standard of living. In Gus's case, saving lives, medical health outcomes. At a more basic level, just being happy, have a se having a sense of well-being. The industrious ones amongst us, just having that sense of achievement the material ones amongst us, accumulating material wealth. There are all sorts of reasons why innately we just want to do something that hasn't been done before. But in trying to set the scene for these two days ahead, we need in this era to add, I believe, to the list something else that hopefully you'll find profound, and that is the issue of the very survival of our species. You know, it's unfashionable to talk about population explosion as it affects the human species. We talk about it in the context of insects and rabbits and whatever. But it is confronting to say that we in ourselves are in the midst of a social experiment, the likes of which we haven't ever been part of before. We are inexorably growing to 10 billion people. The planet itself is not actually growing. And uh, whilst we have achieved extraordinary things as a species in recent times, literally lifting hundreds of millions of people out of abject poverty. The reality is that the world continues to move. Many would say that uh, over the next two or three decades, we're likely to, uh, to lose around 20% of our biodiversity as measured by number of species. In my own lifetime, I was at a CSIRO board meeting not so long ago, and was confronted with the news that in my lifetime, and I'm only going to be on this earth for a, a blimp as far as the history of this planet is concerned, but in my lifetime, our productive food output will be grown by a factor of three times. And all of you know that we have issues about water security, energy security, what, the, what, what do we do about disposal of waste, etc., etc. But we are an intelligent species. Each and every one of you will have extraordinary stories about how, and as Hugh Morgan just put it so well, how rapidly we are coming up with amazing scientific stuff. Let me just give you one example from, uh, again, a CSIRO context. But in the next three or four months, the global radio telescope community will make a decision as to whether this country or another part of the world will host the world's largest radio telescope. Now, I've known about radio telescopes since I was a kid. The Parkes radio telescope, featured in the dish, part of our national heritage. And there are Parkes radio telescopes all around the world that have been receiving data from outer space for a long, long time. But if we have the right, or given the right, to host the square kilometre array, the world's largest radio telescope array, based in Western Australia, extending over 3,000 kilometres, involving 3,000 separate receiving uh, dishes of all sorts of types and descriptions, when they finally turn the switch on and receive the data, in the first six hours, that telescope facility will receive more data than all of radio telescope uh, the, the, the sector has received 
in its entire time and existence. And that is just one of many, many illustrations which sum up the rapidity with which we are actually developing. It is extraordinary. So many of you would say, well, what's the problem? Just growing to 10 billion or so is just yet another challenge that, uh, that we have to deal with. The problem is, I think, that as a species, whilst we have the capacity for enormous intelligence, we have the capacity to stuff it up as well. We may be intelligent, but for so much of our existence, we've proved that we actually behave illogical. Let me just give you one example. Once upon a time, we speculated about what made us happy and well-being. Well, now there's, a, there's an industry that tells us actually what leads to happiness and a sense of well-being. Survey after survey in this country and in countries all around the world actually attest to what derives that. Now, interestingly, we now know as a fact, it's not uh, supposition, but there's a much greater correlation between happiness and well-being on the one hand and when we give of ourselves as opposed to happiness and well-being and just the accumulation of material wealth. Fact, logic. But notwithstanding that, and it's widely understood by many, many of us still don't give. The logic leads to us, I guess, saying we actually don't want to be happy or have that sense of well-being. There are 35 billionaires in this country and not one is generous on a world basis. Their counterparts in the US would look at the 35 billionaires and say something is missing. And indeed something is missing when we don't give, namely a sense of that happiness. And there are many other ways in which we can actually point to ourselves and say, you know, we have all the intelligence up here to make the right decisions, but for whatever reason, sometimes the wires get crossed. If I was to pretend to be, I don't know, an anthropologist or someone who observes the human species over the last several hundred thousand years, ever so simplistically, one could come to the view that in the early days, in the primitive days, as we were surviving, it was largely a matter of hard work. He who hunted most, he who gathered most, survived. Those that didn't, there was no sophisticated social security system back in those days, didn't survive. One or two of us stumbled upon things. We made things that were round and rolled around. They became wheels and perhaps someone else found a lever. But in truth, much of that technology was probably confined to small locations. It took some time before it started to spread out. Of course, uh, as time went on, we realised the extraordinary importance of using our brains. We could cut corners, we could actually make things in very long production runs. We could actually have an impact on our local communities just by doing things differently to what our forebears did. But we race forward into the 21st century and find that nowadays we are this super connected world. Someone finding out something in a lab in Beijing today will literally have it if they want it known throughout the world tomorrow. Um, we all have handheld devices in our pockets and they're made to uh, suit a local uh, environment such as uh, here in Australia. The number of apps on our phones is very, very considerable. Those same devices are made for out of the way places, the third world as well. But in Kenya, chances are I won't be able to afford the phone that I've got in my pocket. But I'll be able to afford something else and it'll actually have perhaps a lesser number of applications, a lesser amount of sophistication but actually suited to my own environment. If I'm a farmer in Kenya, chances are one of the apps that I'll be able to get will be something that tells me what the market price of my goods in the main regional town is. I've actually never had that information before, but it enables me for the first time to negotiate a proper price with the, um, with the middleman. Whilst we're intelligent, we're sometimes illogical. Whilst we're creative, sometimes we're stupid. Whilst we're clever, we actually are often all driven by ego. As the former Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, said, you know, climate science is the great moral challenge of our life. And I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it now, except to say that the science is not actually settled. The experts in this area are arguing day in, day out, whether the globe is going to warm by two or three percent in many decades out. 
the experts in this area are arguing day in, day out, whether our sea levels are going to rise by 80 centimetres or 90 centimetres over a particular period of time. But the experts in this area are not arguing whether human-induced climate change is an issue that we have to deal with. That really was settled a while ago. And yet, as a global community, we still struggle taking this issue seriously. We are so easily distracted by people who either have no idea what they're talking about or others who represent that uh, they're knowledgeable when in fact they're not strongly peer-reviewed and no longer hold current positions in organisations which, um, which respect. Every major academy of science in the world has signed on to saying this is an issue that as a global community we have to deal with. The real issue with climate change, though, it's like the frog in the boiling water. We're coping today. I got up this morning, it wasn't that hot. Turned the tap on, the water came out. The train worked. We're coping. And we're actually coping with all these major challenges. Food security, energy, water, biodiversity, life goes on. But we are on a very steep, slippery slope if we're not listening to our scientists and being guided by what they're actually saying because we require them to look ahead, to tell us in their opinion what is in store for us. And often they say when something is in store for us there's something we can do about it today. We don't have to do about we don't have to take out that insurance policy today. But when the best brains in the world say that we ought to, surely logic dictates that we should heed their advice. You know, the human race has all the endeavour that it's ever needed. We certainly have the, the brains, the technology. There is one thing that is questionable at the moment, and that is, do we actually have the will to survive? Do we actually have the collective spirit to come together and say, you know what, living on this earth's not a bad thing, and let's make a commitment to keep going? Maybe an odd statement to make. But actually, I'm not sure that the human species as a whole has made that commitment collectively. Part of the way in which we're going to collectively come to that point is firstly, as Gus no doubt was impressing upon all of you this morning, that you know the, we, we used to use decades ago the word global village. It was the domain of, some would say, beatniks and different people. The word global village is a very, very relevant term today. What we do in this country, so far away from other people in the rest of the world does directly affect everyone else on the planet. Secondly, whether it's in politics, whether it's in business, or increasingly whether it's in the social sector, the community sector, long-term logical thinking has to prevail over short-term opportunistic thinking. And uh, we all know about the impact of that in politics and in business, but let me just quickly say that the other day I was sitting around a board table of a of a large NGO and we're having to make the agonising decision of whether to inject money into the Horn of Africa today and save people from starving today as opposed to depriving them of those resources and investing in something else that wouldn't actually generate a social return for another three or four years. These sorts of decisions are decisions that pervade throughout all of society. Thirdly, as I said before, we have to be driven by science. We have to put science on this pedestal that it deserves. And any claptrap, such as I heard recently coming out of the Tea Party movement, that actually science is really just a global conspiracy designed to keep scientists in jobs. Let me say very clearly that I have said to the best and brightest people in CSIRO, I'm personally going to try and do whatever I can to nominate them for a Nobel Science Prize. The first one who comes up and says, Climate change is not real. There is no greater incentive for any scientist to be recognised by their peers through such an award. There is no conspiracy in science. Science is replete with uh, truly inspirational individuals who give up so much else simply to try and take us forward on the journey of survival. There may be pockets of bad eggs and what have you here and there, but overall we are so well served by science. What we need to do is, is, is to be listening and following its advice rather than taking it on from a position of ignorance. 
And finally, we are in an era where actually, whilst as a species, we've developed these extraordinary silos of specialisation. You know, a young doctor nowadays entering the medical profession is often gazing ahead. How detailed in his knowledge can he be in a particular part of medical science? Wonderful stuff. But actually, at the same time as we're becoming so specialised, we also need to remain super connected. We, in the, um, particularly in the Western world, have developed three great sectors, business, government, and the non-for-profit sector, which does all the stuff that the other two can't get their minds around. But never before has there been a need for those three great sectors to be more connected and collaborating and working together to solve our massive problems. I think that the greatest thinkers in each of those three sectors at the moment are those that are actually thinking outside their sector, looking over the walls and saying, how can I best push some cause forward or uh, improve humanity by actually collaborating with people that I'm actually uncomfortable with? They're wired differently, they're motivated differently, they have different skills, but at the end of the day, there are very few silver bullets nowadays found in one single laboratory. Increasingly, the problems we are dealing with are very complex. It requires a mix of science, humanity, people skills, leadership, effective government, advocacy, whatever it is. And the best and brightest all need to be brought together, notwithstanding that they've come from different places. Egos need to, lead, need to be led, left outside the room. Short-term aspirations for being centre of stage, leading organisations are not relevant. It is an indictment in this country that uh, we've not had one Prime Minister in the last 50 years who's left under their, own, uh, under their own circumstances. Each and every one has actually been forcibly evicted. As individuals, we need to put self second, community first if we have any hope of continuing on. Thank you.